Hello, we welcome the This is Ali Nessie, and I'm here today with Dr. Ian Grayson, Harvard Postdoctoral Orlando Fellow. Uh, and we're doing another tutorial on the area of endodontic management of the, uh, of the medically compromised patient. And today's patient is a uh, cancer patient, and we're going to talk about uh, its uh, management for treatment and so on. Ian, again, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for inviting me. So, Ian, we have a patient uh, that you have seen, and uh, why don't you introduce us to the case first, and then we'll talk about uh, the management considerations. Sure, sure. Um, this case involved a 48-year-old male who was a former smoker. Uh, he was treated for tongue cancer back in 2008 with both radiation and chemotherapy. He's currently in remission, and when you look at his medical history, he has absolutely no medical issues and takes no medication and he presented with a resting blood pressure of 113 over 80. And we can see here when we look at him from a frontal view anterior uh, photograph, he's certainly got extensive caries mostly in the cervical area and later when we take a look at it, it will extend into the interproximal areas as well. When we look at the x-rays here, the bite wings right and left side, you can see how extensive the caries is. Um, it varies from caries which goes right through into the pulpal tissues to on the surface just in the enamel and dentin areas. And as we look through each uh, quadrant, we can see that it is fairly extensive. There's mild periodontal disease as well associated with this case, but generally speaking, the thing of note here is the extension of the caries uh, into the uh, tooth. And again, we look at the anterior sections. Um, some of the teeth have actually uh, been infiltrated um, right through and there are a couple of fractured teeth as well. So in terms of this patient, our treatment plan was going to be as conservative as possible, taking into consideration his cancer treatment and his radiation treatment and his chemotherapy. So what we decided to do in this particular case was we decided to totally avoid all, all extractions and all surgical treatment. Uh, we were not going to do anything that involves cutting or would involve any kind of healing process. So we were going to do caries control and restoration with glass ionomer uh, materials in those teeth that did not have pulpal involvement. In those teeth that did have pulpal involvement, we were going to do endodontic procedures and cover it up with, and with glass ionomer uh, restorations. And those teeth that were deemed to be non-restorable, we were going to do endodontic treatment, we were going to seal them with glass ionomer, and then that would be followed by decoronation. The last phase of our treatment would be the fabrication of maxillary and mandibular removable partial dentures to fill in for those decoronated teeth and the, for those edentulous areas. Hmm. So, Ian, uh, I can see that you have uh, yourself a great treatment plan for this patient who unfortunately has uh, had bad luck with, with cancer, but we see patients that have um, cancer are either going uh, prior to going to uh, treatment or in the middle of treatment or just immediately after treatments. What are some of the considerations temporarily for patients that go through these? So let's go through the phases for, of a cancer treatment and see um, what are the considerations that we need to keep in mind as endodontists or endodontic practitioners dealing with these patients for, uh, because obviously rampant decay is pretty uh, common, uh, common in these patients. Let's start by talking about patients that have just been diagnosed with cancer and they're about to go under treatment. What are the considerations there? Well, certainly th this is a very, very important issue to consider if the patient has just been diagnosed and is about to undergo treatment. Uh, what you want to do is any invasive procedure, and by invasive I mean surgery or extractions, they should be done a minimum of 14 days prior to radiation therapy, and when, in terms of chemotherapy, at least 10 days before chemotherapy is initiated. When you look at these patients, a careful oral examination should be performed. Uh, caries control is certainly paramount. And any endodontic procedures that are noted at the time should be completed uh, prior to any kind of therapy. We want to consider especially those teeth which will be in the field of radiation. So teeth that are going to be in the field of radiation should be definitely treated and even the teeth with the slightest of problems should be looked at then because radiation tends to amplify even small problems. And very, very important with these patients, you've got to 
give them oral hygiene instruction. They have to maintain their mouths to a hot, far higher standard than the average person because of their susceptibility to oral disease. And that's brushing, flossing, and fluoride rinses, which are absolutely mandatory for these patients, and it has to be done on a continual basis. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think in this case, this is one of those situations in which the communication with the patient, making them aware of what they're going through and its implications, uh, could go a long way in preparing them to prevent some of the problems that are the consequence of treatment of cancer. Because it's almost like orthodontic therapy, right? If you're going to be putting braces on for two years and you don't tell your patients that they're going to have to clean 10 times more than a regular patient, you're going to have straight teeth, but they're going to be all bummed out and decayed. The same thing here is if patients are aware of the changes that occur during the treatment, uh, whether it's radiation or chemotherapy, they could be better, um, you know, better equipped to deal uh, with the problems uh, such as rampant decay as we saw in that previous patient. Mm -hmm. So uh, what about right immediately following radiation therapy? Radiation therapy is fairly common uh, in terms of treatment. What are the considerations that we need to keep in mind? Well, when you have a patient who's coming in just following radiation therapy, generally speaking, the muscles of mastication, which are directly in line with the beam, will suffer trismus. And that makes dental appointments very, very difficult. It, it makes it difficult for the patient to hold open for an extended period of time, and also it makes it difficult for the patient to actually manipulate their jaw while you're working on them. So what we suggest is very, very short appointments for those patients and the use of a bite block or some kind of bite stabilizer when you're working on these patients. Mm -hmm. uh, another serious consideration is the demineralized areas of the teeth. These should be treated immediately. As soon as you see it, get in there and treat it. Don't allow it to expand because what happens is with the loss of salivary gland function, there's no ability to remineralize those teeth. As we know, there's high levels of calcium and phosphate within the normal salivary flow, and you're dealing with a supersaturated solution bathing the teeth all the time. You won't have that anymore. So the odds of remineralization, a carious lesion, are very, very low. You're also dealing with a decrease or a drop in the pH, and this leads to further decay. So you lose your buffering action for your saliva, you, you get a drop in pH, and all of this adds and contributes to extensive decay. And that's what we essentially see in a lot of these patients. Mm -hmm. Now, if any surgical procedures need to be done, they should be avoided uh, due to the risk of osteoradionecrosis. And osteoradionecrosis takes place or happens whenever we cut into or we do any kind of procedures with the bone. Mm -hmm. in, in that particular case, if it's unavoidable, what we have to do is we have to do it extremely carefully, we have to do it under very sterile conditions, and we have to use a lot of antibiotic coverage to make sure that we don't run into problems on those patients. Yeah. Another uh, side effect of um, um of treatment, whether it's radiation or any other kind of chemotherapy, is mucositis, which is a very, very um, unfortunate side effect, very painful to many patients. Can you talk about that and how it would influence? Sure. Mucositis is, is a, a very, very serious consequence of any form of uh, cancer treatment. As a matter of fact, in some very, very severe cases, cancer treatment is actually stopped because the patient is in so much discomfort. And, and what mucositis is, is it's an extremely painful condition where you get inflammation and ulceration of the oral mucosa. And generally speaking, um, dental treatment should be avoided during the acute phases of mucositis because it's so uncomfortable for the patient to have any kind of manipulation done with the mouth at that point in time. And when you look at it, mucositis results um, because of radiation therapy, it results because of chemotherapy, and it also results um, from patients who are on immu immunosuppressive therapy following bone marrow transplants. It's fairly common. It occurs between 5 and 15 percent of all patients who are being treated for cancer. And, and the reasoning or the rationale behind it, it tends to be an immune-mediated condition which results from the release of inflammatory cytokines within the oral cavity. The way this can be treated, or not actually treated but managed, is very, very good oral hygiene and rinses which have high levels of fluoride and even topical anesthetics in them. And there is one drug which is approved called palifermin which can be used and prescribed by the oncologist. Yeah. That is true. Again, it goes back to the whole point of communication with the patient about what are some of the possible side effects and how to, uh, to treat uh, these on their own by having improved oral hygiene. 
So another side effect of treatment, especially radiation, would be osteoradionecrosis. Uh, again, another serious complication of treatment. How do we, how does that affect our treatment anodonically in terms of um, decision making? Well, osteoradionecrosis would not affect us for conventional uh, endodontic treatment, uh, where we're doing non-surgical endodontic treatment. It would not be a factor in that. However, it may be a factor in the healing of the bone following that. So um, if there's a periapical lesion present, we may note that that lesion may stay for a longer period of time or require more time to ultimately heal. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, osteoradionecrosis is a factor when a surgical procedure is done, and that would be for us as endodontists, uh, if we're doing apical surgery, we should try to avoid it in these patients. It's fairly common, it occurs in about three to 10% of the patients who undergo radiation therapy. And basically it involves the diminished ability of the bone to withstand any kind of trauma or infection. And it results from damage to very, very small blood vessels uh, in the bone. So what we have is we have our osteocytes, which are our bone cells, which are responsible for uh, maturation and remodeling our bone. They're deprived of both oxygen and nutrients, so they don't normally uh, manufacture new bone. So this bone can become necrotic if we work on it, and we have to be very, very careful of that. Certainly secondary infection is very, very common in these, and the unfortunate thing with respect to osteoradionecrosis is that even over long periods of time, once the area has been exposed to radiation, it does not get better. That area, which is in the direct line of the radiation beam, will always be a problem. So we always have to be careful for whatever procedures were going to be done there. Yeah. Now, what, one more quick thing. Yeah. Uh, in terms of treatment, um, if osteoradionecrosis does occur, um, we want to cure at that area, get rid of any sequestrum or necrotic bone. We want to use large doses of antibiotics. And in very rare cases where it does not resolve, we can even resort to hyperbaric oxygen. Hyperbaric oxygen, that's right. So that is uh, for osteoradionecrosis. What about uh, just during treatment? If patients having chemotherapy, they come and see you, they have an emergency procedure um, that they're seeing you for, but they are under chemotherapy at that time. What are some of the considerations in that situation? Well, generally speaking, with chemotherapy, um, you get a, a resulting uh, suppression of hemopoietic or marrow cells. Mm -hmm. And there are three main types of cells that we have to consider that are very important in this aspect. Number one are the platelets. Number two are the white blood cells, notably the neutrophils. And number three, the red blood cells. These are all instrumental and dictate how we do our treatment. So when we look, say, at platelets, we want to have a platelet count that's above 75,000. If it falls anywhere below that, we're obviously going to be dealing with a bit of a bleeding problem. Yeah, sure. yeah. Certainly. And neutrophils. Neutrophils are very important. Without neutrophils, we have very little ability to combat infection. We want a neutrophil count that's above 1,000. If it falls below 500, we definitely cannot do any kind of treatment, and that patient has to be brought into a hospital setting and be treated under the auspices of an oncologist. Mm -hmm. um, when you're treating uh, in, during chemotherapy, it's always better to treat when the patient has finished one cycle and is in a resting period or at the end of all his treatment. You do not want to treat a patient while he's actively ongoing with chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. Terrific. So what about uh, after chemotherapy? And you, so you have had patients that come in before treatment, during treatment, and many patients have uh, been through chemotherapy and now they're seeing you for an emergency procedure. What are the considerations then? Again, it's the same kind of treatment that we mentioned before, the three blood cells which have been depressed. Now, oftentimes, those blood cells will recover, and you'll get higher levels of platelets, you'll get higher levels of neutrophils, and you'll get higher levels of red blood cells. But generally speaking, that has to be coordinated with an oncologist. You have to get those readings before you treat the patient. If there's any doubt, certainly a consultation is in order. And one other thing, um, for a specific type of cancer, many types of multiple myeloma, 
myeloma are treated with bisphosphonates. That's important for you to know because obviously there's bisphosphonate induced osteonecrosis. And in terms of that, we have to be aware of that as well. So verify the use of bisphosphonates. Certainly look at red blood cell counts, white blood cell counts, and platelet counts. And they're all instrumental and important in how we assess and how we treat our patients. And yeah, you're absolutely right. Okay, so I think we kind of went over some of the considerations prior to treatment, during treatment, and after treatments. What are some of the conclusions that we can draw overall for treating uh, patients that are um, cancer patients who are about to go or after, uh, during or after uh, treatment? Generally speaking, you want to initiate treatment prior to any kind of cancer treatment. You want to look after that patient because the ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, as they say. And in this particular case, any kind of uh, dental treatment, which is even a small problem, should be addressed prior to any kind of treatment. During treatment, when we're looking at things, we're always in consultation with an oncologist to make sure that the patient is suitable for our treatment. If not, things have to be done in an altered fashion. And certainly post uh, radiation or post chemotherapy, we always want to consider what are the consequences of that treatment, whether it's uh, radiation therapy, which can result in osteoradionecrosis, uh, the trismus, which is certainly present when we x-ray, uh, give radiation therapy through the muscles and mastication. All these have to be taken into consideration before we treat these patients. But one of the most important things is with these patients, they have to have ongoing uh, care. They have to have a very good home care. They have to look after their teeth um, because they are predisposed to caries. They're predisposed to periodontal disease um, because of the loss of salivary flow and the loss of salivary gland function. So that's the bottom line with these patients. Absolutely, and to lastly add patients that are either about to or during treatment or after treatment, obviously cancer is not a, um, um, uh, you know, something that people take lightly and patients that are going uh, through treatment or about to go through treatment also are highly anxious. It's very important to uh, be able to communicate with them and have uh, great empathy because uh, it's a very difficult time for many people that are have been diagnosed with it and they're going through it and it's important to kind of be able to uh, at least make their treatment during under your care as you know as humane and considerate as possible because um, um, you know every obviously uh, the, the, their anxiety level will certainly have also an effect on the treatment uh, that they they receive well uh, Ian thank you so much for um, spending the time today it was great I'm sure it was very helpful to our viewers as well and uh, we'll hopefully come back and do some more of these videos. My pleasure. Thank you very much. So we will then. I'm Ali Nassan. I was joined by the Ian Grayson, postdoctoral fellow at Harvard School of Medicine. And we hope you found this information helpful.